God bless you. The March 1988 tape of the month is a teaching by Dr. Werwill from the Georgia Limb Meeting on April 7, 1985. Dr. Werwill taught the moment of a new age. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Victor Paul Werwill. Today I thought I'd like to bless you people in dealing with the subject of the moment of a new age. Saturday is the seventh day of a week, and Jesus Christ arose on Saturday. This in itself is significant because seven, biblically, seven is the number of perfection. And when everything was perfected for your redemption and mine and Jesus Christ had paid it all, then God raised him from the dead and it was on the seventh day. These things are all so significant to me because numbers in scripture are not used haphazardly. They're used with a very great mathematical exactness. And you just keep learning. It was just this week, this past week, that I learned why Jesus Christ was on the cross for six hours. You know, I knew he was crucified at nine in the morning and died at three in the afternoon at the exact hour when the Passover lamb was killed. But I'd really never given it any great thought. Why six hours? Because once they nailed him to the cross, if that was really all that was to it, why didn't he just give up his life then? He didn't die on the cross because they nailed it to him. The scripture says he gave up his life. He laid it down. He could have laid it down five minutes after they nailed him up there and he wouldn't have had to suffer for the rest of the hours. But the reason he was on the cross for six hours because six is the biblical number for man. And Jesus Christ died for all men's sins all over the world. And that's why he was hanged on the cross and he stayed there for six hours. And the reason he was crucified in the midst of four is because four is a world number. And he died for the sins of the world, therefore he was crucified in the midst of four. And God raised him on the third day because of the divine perfection of that day. It is also remarkable to me that when Jesus Christ appeared for the first time on what we know as the first day of the week, Easter Sunday, he appeared unto Mary Magdalene. And that record is in Mark 16 class. Mark 16 in verse 9. Now when, and the word when is after. Mark 16, 9. Now after Jesus was risen early, the first of the week. The word day you don't need. The first of the week, which would be Easter Sunday. First day of the week would still be Easter Sunday. He appeared first to whom? Mary Magdalene. Out of whom he had cast what? Seven devils. That to me, class, is a remarkable statement of truth. You would think after all of this period of time and all the people that took a crack at Jesus Christ, all those governmental leaders, all the religious leaders, that once God had raised him from the dead and Jesus had successfully completed his whole mission, the first ones that he should have appeared to were those dudes that were responsible basically for his death. But he didn't. He appeared first to Mary Magdalene. Now, Mary Magdalene was not a woman of 
great society importance. He was not one of those blue bloods. She was a woman out of whom he had done what? Cast seven devils. And she was a woman that really loved him because all during those six hours he was hanging on the cross, she was at the cross. Later when Joseph of Arimathea took Jesus' body and buried it in that new sepulcher, Mary Magdalene stood far off and watched it happen. Then later on, when the, the following day, when they set the guards and they sealed the tomb politically and officially, she watched them do all of this. So she was a woman with great love in her heart for Jesus Christ. And to me, it's a remarkable thing that on his first appearance on Easter Sunday, he appeared to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven devils. But as he appeared to her, there's a record in John 20, you have to understand, at the time of disappearance to Mary Magdalene. John chapter 20. Verse 11, John twenty eleven. But Mary stood without at the sepulcher, weeping. And as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the sepulcher, and seeth two angels in white sitting, the one at the head, the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. It wasn't there any longer. That's where it had lain. And those two angels said unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? She saith unto them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I know not where they have laid him. And when she had thus said, she turned herself about and saw Jesus standing in his resurrected body, and knew not that it was Jesus. Verse 15. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? Whom seek thou? She, supposing him, Jesus, to be the gardener, saith unto him, Sir, if thou hast borne him hence, tell me where thou hast laid him, and I will take him away. Verse 16, Jesus saith unto her, Mary, and she turned herself and saith unto him, Rabboni, which is to say, Master. Then verse 17, Jesus saith unto her, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my Father, but go to my brethren and say unto them, I am to send to my Father and your Father to my God and your God. She recognized Jesus and nat- her natural instinct was to reach out and touch him. And then Jesus made this statement, Touch me not, for I have not yet ascended. The reason he had to make this statement because Jesus Christ is the complete fulfillment of all the law. And this was the first day after the weekly Sabbath, Saturday. And on this first day after that first weekly Sabbath of the Passover, Feast of Unleavened Bread was when the high priest had to go into the temple and wave the first sheep of barley and dedicate it because this was the day from which they started counting 50 days to Pentecost this Easter Sunday morning seven weeks of seven Saturdays, and then the following day, Sunday, would always be Pentecost. And of course, you and I looking back know that that Pentecost that's coming now in 50 days is going to be much different than any Pentecost they've ever celebrated before. And that's why Jesus said, do not touch me, because the law required that the individual, the priest that would, high priest that would present that sheaf of barley, 
in no way could be contaminated or touched by any other human being after he had been cleansed, before he made the offering. And Jesus Christ had been totally remade. He came out of the tomb with a totally new body, and in that resurrected body that he appeared to Mary, he said to her, Touch me not, for I have not yet ascended to my Father. That does not mean he was going to go to heaven. You and I know that happened some 40 days later, the ascension. What happened here is not yet ascended. He's not yet gone to the temple and made that presentation to the Father. He's not yet ascended up to the temple to make that presentation. That's the meaning because you and I know 40 days later is when he ascended into heaven and seated at the right hand of the Father. And we also know that later on in the day, here he said, touch me not. Yet later on in the day, according to Matthew 28, Verse 8, And they departed quickly from the sepulcher with fear and great joy and did run to bring his disciples' word. Verse 9, And as they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them, saying, All hail. And they came and held him by the feet and did what? Worshipped him. See? When he first appeared to Mary, he said, Touch me not. Yet here in Matthew, a little while later, they all touch him. They fell at his feet and worshipped him. And that worship does not mean that he was God. They were just grateful that they could see him again. It's a recognition, respect. The same as I saw you do here today for your leadership. I noticed when Don walked in, you all stood. You didn't worship him as God, but you got a respect for your leadership. When I walked in, you all stood. And everybody knows I ain't God. <laughs> so, so you didn't stand to worship me as God. You stood simply as respect. And that's wonderful. Just like now, if I was sitting where you are and you walked in to teach the Word of God, I would stand for you in respect that you're going to be teaching the Word. If the governor of... Georgia walked in, I'd stand for him. If the President of the United States walked in, I'd stand for him. Simply a matter of respect is to worship. That's the meaning of that word. Well, anyways, he said to her, Touch me not, for I'm not yet ascended. Now you know what that means. This Easter Sunday was the first day of the week. And the first day of the week is always the eighth day. Saturday is the seventh day of the week. And following Saturday comes the eighth day, which is the first day of the week. And the number eight means, biblically, a new beginning. So on this first day of the week, when Jesus Christ appeared for the first time in his resurrected body to the people... It was a new beginning, and what a tremendous new beginning it was for the apostles and the disciples living at that time. The apostles and the disciples class did not need to prove that Jesus Christ arose from the dead. It was self-evident. The sepulcher was there, the grave clothes wrapping intact, but there was no body in it. You know, every two, three minutes you see the fire engine going in this town and then you see cars running up behind it. That's such a common sight in this town. I don't know why anybody ever want to follow a fire engine in this town or a police siren. They're here all the time. Just for a moment, think of this mind-blowing situation in Jerusalem. Everybody of any knowledge whatsoever knew that Jesus Christ had died on the cross. 
They knew he was dead. They knew he had been buried. They knew that the sepulcher had been officially sealed by the government. They'd even set guards to watch it. Everybody knew this. Now, all at once, there is no longer a stone on the door of the tomb. People can look down in. There is the wrappings of the body that have hardened just in there. like looks just like a mummy laying in there. But there's no body inside of it. Everybody can see it. The tomb and sepulcher is wide open. How many people from Jerusalem do you think went over there and looked in that sepulcher? Everybody. (laughs) But there was no body there. That must have blown some minds. (laughs) The grave clothes, the wrappings were intact, but no body. So the disciples did not need to prove that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. The proof was right there in that sepulcher. You and I, living on this beautiful Sunday, 1985, need not prove Jesus Christ arose from the dead. It too is self-evident. For speaking in tongues is the external manifestation of the internal reality of God in Christ, in you, the living reality and hope of glory. And what a new day, a new beginning day this is for us living at this time. You and I could not be born again. We could not speak in tongues if God had not raised him. If he had not ascended, seated at the right hand and gave forth this, which you now see in here on the day of Pentecost originally. So we don't have to prove anything about Christ's resurrection to anybody. All we need to do is manifest the Christ in us. Speaking in tongues is that external manifestation right here in the census world that you have God in Christ in you, which you could not have if God had not raised him from the dead. You and I can't go back to Jerusalem and look in the sepulcher. They've gotten rid of it. We don't need it. We've got something even more sure than that open sepulcher. We have the eternal reality and presence and hope of Christ in us. So this is a moment of a new age began at that time. And also for all of us, it's a new beginning for us living at this time. In the book of Hebrews, and there's great learning in the book of Hebrews regarding some of these wonderful truths that I'm setting before you today to bless your heart with. A lot of learning in Hebrews. Chapter 2, please. Verse 1, therefore, literally the text reads, on account of this, on account of this what? That which is stated previously. On account of this, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast and every transgression and disobedience received, a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which as the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard? God also bearing witness with both signs and wonders and with divers miracles and distributions or gifts of Holy Spirit according to his own will. Not to angels hath he put in subjection the world to come whereof we speak. But one in a certain place testified, saying, 
What is man that thou art mindful of him, or the son of man that thou visitest him? Thou madest him a little lower than God. Angels is the word God. Thou crownest him with glory and honor, and didst set him over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet, for in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. But now we see not yet all things put under him. But we see whom? Jesus, who was made a little lower than God. Again, angels is the word Elohim, God. For the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, Jesus, by the grace of God, should taste death for what? Every man. He died for every man. For it became him, God, for whom are all things and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation. And the captain is Jesus Christ, perfect through sufferings. And the word sufferings is experiences. Perfect through experience. Verse 11. For both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one, for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. And again, I will put my trust in him, upon him. And again, behold, I and the children which God gave or hath given me. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy. And that word destroy is translated by Rotherham paralyzed. I think it's a good, that he might paralyze him, that's the adversary, holding the power of death, that's the devil. Verse 15. And deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage, is the word slavery. For verily, verse 16, he took not on himself the nature of angels, but he, Jesus Christ, took upon him the seed of what? Abraham. Wherefore in all things it behooved him to become like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. For wherein he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to succor them that are tempted. Chapter 3. Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our confession. Profession is confession. Christ Jesus, who was faithful to him that appointed him, as also Moses was faithful in all his house. All I want you to do is to think as I read this with you. I can't stop every line and explain everything. It's very well explained. Just put your head in it and follow along logically. For this man was counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he who hath built the house hath more honor than the house. For every house is built by some man, but he that built all things is whom? God. And Moses verily was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which were to be spoken later or after. But Christ as a son over his own house, whose house are we? If we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end. Wherefore, as the Holy Spirit saith today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation, in the day of temptation, in the wilderness. The provocation was the proving of the children of Israel. 
and they hardened their hearts in the day in the wilderness. Verse 9, When your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works forty years, wherefore I was grieved with that generation and said, They do always err in their heart, and they have not known my ways. So I swear in my wrath they shall not enter into my rest. Not going to get into the promised land. Take heed, brethren, verse 12. Lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we're made partakers of Christ. As we hold the beginning of our confidence, our confession, steadfast unto the end. While it is said today, if ye will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation. For someone they had heard did provoke. They rebelled. Howbeit not all that came out of Egypt by Moses, but with whom was he grieved forty years? Was it not with them that had sinned? whose carcasses fell in the wilderness. Verse 18. And to whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest, but to them that believe not. So we see that they could not enter in because of one thing, what? Unbelief. Chapter 4. Let us therefore fear, have reverence, lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached, as well as unto them, but the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with believing in them that heard it. Verse 3, For we which have believed do enter into rest, as he said, As I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he spake in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise, and God did rest the seventh day. And in verse 5, this place again, if they shall enter into my rest. Seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter therein, and they to whom it was first preached entered not in because of unbelief. Again, verse 7. He limiteth a certain day, saying in David, Today, after so long a time, as it said, Today, if you'll hear his voice, harden not your hearts. For if Jesus had given them rest, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day. There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. A tremendous verse. A rest to the people of God who have the believing. For he that is entered into his rest, he also has ceased from his own works as God did from his. Let us labor, therefore, to enter. The labor is to believe. Let us believe, therefore, to enter into that rest. Lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief that they fell in the wilderness with. Now look at this explanation. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing of sunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner, a critic of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted as we are yet without sin. Verse 16. Let us therefore come boldly under the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Flip over to chapter 7 for a moment. Verse 25. Wherefore he is able also to save them to the what? 
uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. Verse 26. For such an high priest became us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separated from sinners, and made higher than the heavens. Chapter 8, verse 1. Now of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. We have such an high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and not man. Look at verse 6. But now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry, by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises. Chapter 9, verse 11. But Christ being come and high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Verse 13, For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean, sanctified to the purifying of the flesh, Verse 14, how much more shall the blood of Christ class, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. If all of those things in the Old Testament covenant were accomplished through the blood of bulls and goats and by the high priest, Jesus Christ as the high priest entering in once, accomplished much more because it wasn't the blood of bulls and goats. It was his own sinless blood that he laid down. And those scriptures are absolutely mind-blowing. You know, they're just fantastic. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience, Conscience is a habit pattern. We've all built habit patterns in our life. But God, with Christ in you and you knowing the word, you can even purge, cleanse out, and change that old habit pattern, that old conscience. It'll purge it. You don't have to live with the past in your mind. And it's wonderful to have Jesus Christ as the high priest sitting at the right hand of God where he makes intercession for us. And another wonderful thing is that as it said in verse 15 of chapter 4 that he is touched by the feeling of our infirmities, our shortcomings. And the reason he is able to help us people is because He was tempted in all things like as we are yet without sin. And Jesus Christ could not have redeemed us if he had not been tempted in all points like we are. How could he have redeemed mankind if he had no temptation to overcome? That's why verse 16 says, Let us therefore come, what? Boldly unto the throne of grace. And that's how you have to approach God in prayer, people, in your life. You just have to come boldly with your opportunities. You have to present yourself boldly before his throne of grace and just give yourself totally to him and let him handle some of your opportunities for you. Let him handle all of them. Just give them to him. But you've got to come boldly, not hesitantly, not reluctantly, not doubtfully. You come with believing. He is the mediator. Jesus Christ is not only the mediator, he's also the intercessor. And a mediator is one who stands between. Jesus Christ stands between you and the Father. And so he is the mediator between you and the Father. And when you appear before the Father boldly, he is the intercessor for you. 
that you may have your soul's sincere desires fulfilled. God absolutely wants his best for every one of you. It is we who shortchange ourselves by not wanting the best for ourselves or by applying those principles that do not make available the best. But God gave his only begotten son and raised him from the dead. And Jesus Christ appeared here on the first day of the week, which is a new beginning. That was a moment of a new age. There were never any Jesus people until God raised him from the dead and the day of Pentecost. When Christ was born in and had eternal life. We're men and women with Christ in us, which is a new nature. God's nature in Christ in us. You have a new nature. It's the nature of the love of God. It's a new age. We are Jesus Christ men and women. You're really not your own. You've been bought with a price, it says in the word. We are Jesus Christ men and women. So we ought to act like it. We ought to walk like it. ought to continue to manifest and claim the promises and see it happen. The moment of a new age began with the resurrection. And it's been a mind blower for people ever since. And it still is today. So, you come boldly under the throne of grace. And remember, it's the word of God that is quick and sharp. Most people think they got sharp minds. They're dull compared to the word of God. It's that word of God that is quick powerful, living and powerful. I'd like to close this wonderful hour with you from the Gospel of John, chapter 20, please. I think the greatest teaching I've ever heard on the Word's way or man's way of service, Reverend Martindale gave this morning to our people in word and business and profession. It was a gem. Gospel of John, chapter 20, please. Verse 1. The first day of the week, or the first of the week, which you and I know is Easter Sunday, cometh Mary Magdalene early when it was yet dark under the sepulcher, and seeth the stone taken away from the sepulchre. Then she runneth and cometh to Simon Peter. This stone rolled away from the sepulchre is real interesting. On Saturday afternoon, shortly after Mary and some of the other women had left, there was an earthquake and the stone was rolled off of the sepulcher and Jesus Christ arose. But the women not being there didn't see that stone rolled away at that time. And the scriptures said that when the angel came down and rolled it away, one angel sat on top of the stone and that all the guards became like dead men. They froze. But you see, the women had not seen that. So on Easter Sunday, as we refer to it, when they come to the sepulcher, they still expect what on top of it? The stone. Why? Because they had seen it sealed with the stone and they had seen the guards there. That's why the women could not properly anoint Jesus' body previous to this Sunday, which they were going to do. Because after Joseph of Arimathea buried Jesus, Nicodemus came right afterwards when Joseph of Arimathea left and embalmed Jesus Christ properly according to Judean custom, which the women did not see either. So on Friday, Wednesday Christ died. Thursday was a high day, Feast of Unleavened Day. Friday, the women bought the spices and got them ready, but they knew they couldn't go 
to the sepulcher and anoint the body because the body had been sealed and was protected with guards with machine guns. <laughs> so they couldn't go. Saturday was the weekly Sabbath. They couldn't go then either. So the first chance they had to go to anoint the body would have been Easter Sunday. That's why they went early while it was still dark. But it was only Mary Magdalene who went there, right? (laughs) And she saw the stone taken away from the sepulcher. Then she runneth and cometh to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved and saith unto them, They have taken away the Lord out of the sepulcher and we know not where they have laid him. Peter therefore went and that other disciple and came to the sepulcher. So they both ran together and the other disciple did outrun Peter and came first to the sepulcher. And he stooping down and looking in saw the linen clothes lying. Yet went he not in. Then cometh Simon Peter following him And he went into the sepulcher and seeth the linen clothes lie. And this word linen clothes here, like the one previous, is grave wrappings. The linen cloth that Joseph of Arimathea buried Jesus in was just like a linen sheet. This word that's an entirely different word than this word, linen here, Othanon is this linen cloth, which is grave wrappings. When in and seeth this, the grave wrappings. Verse 7, and the cloth that was about his head, not lying with the Othanion clothes, with the wrappings, but folded together in a place by himself. When Peter went down into that sepulcher and he looked, there was that grave wrappings, everything intact, but the napkin, when they wrapped the body, they left the face area, nose, mouth open. They just put a cloth over the top. And that cloth had been folded, wrapped, and placed in a a nook of the sepulcher, little old niche up there in the sepulcher. And that again, I just blesses my soul. Whenever God works, it's always in detail and always with beautiful perfection. He wasn't in such a hurry to get Jesus Christ up out of the grave that he just had that napkin flung on the floor and somebody step on it. When he got him up, he had him to fold that little napkin nicely and stick it back up in the corner over here so that everything was neat and order in the sepulcher. Then went in also that other disciple, verse 8, which came first to the sepulcher, and he saw, and he, what? The reason he believed it because of what? He saw. He saw that grave wrapping there just by... The best I know to describe it, if you've seen Egyptian mummies places, that's exactly the best I know to describe it. Because by the third day, all of that ointment and Nicodemus brought a hundred pounds, approximately a hundred pounds of ointment that he put on that cloth, those wrappings around Jesus. And if Jesus weighed 160 pounds plus 100 pounds of that, we'd have at least 260 pounds laying there when Jesus was in there. But when Peter gets there, he sees this, and that other disciple comes in, and he saw this, and he believed. You see, if they would have, if they'd have, stolen the body out of it, they would have had to break that, cut it open, and then steal the body or steal the whole thing. But the thing was totally intact with the exception no body inside. And that's what this disciple saw. Totally intact. The little napkin laid up in the corner. He saw and he believed. 
he saw that there was no body in it. And that is what enabled him to believe. For us, faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by what? You see, somebody shows you the word, teaches you the word, and you believe that word, and that's what causes you to get saved. Peter and the disciple whom Jesus loved went down into that sepulcher. They saw that, and they believed. You see God's word, and you believe. In these resurrection classes, we will show God's word to people, and those who want to will believe and they get the results of their believing. And if they don't believe, they get the consequences of their unbelief like the children of Israel did that we read about in the book of Hebrews. So class, you have only one of two ways to go. You either go the believing way of God's word or go the unbelieving way and suffer the consequences. To me, a man has to be stupider than stupid not to want to go the way of the word and not to want to fellowship with people who are endeavoring to walk the way of the word and to make the living reality of God's presence so real. So today we still see the word and this word makes it possible for us to believe, to get born again, to have Christ in us, the hope of glory. So it's a wonderful day and a wonderful time, and I certainly thank you for allowing me to share my heart and my love with you on this beautiful Easter Sunday, 1985. God bless. Thank you.